Sonic Universe Issue 53. So Bunny approaches the Iron Fortress, and she and the Legionnaires get greeted by someone I don't recognize, who's acting oddly nice. She says the Raiju clan will transport the oil from here and return the saucers to them. The awful-looking character hopes it won't be storming when they fly again, so I wonder if that's foreshadowing. And we can already see that their leader got cybernetic eyes just like in the reboot. I thought we'd see her look normal one last time first, not instantly skip to this, because it's from the reboot. Considering how dark it is for them to get cybernetics instead of them simply getting parts of themselves roboticized, I guess it makes sense that we didn't see when she first got her upgrades. She wastes Bunny's time greeting her, saying that she knows about her from the internet. She doesn't trust her because she thinks she betrayed her allies, and Bunny worries that it did look that way, and explains away that she's loyal to her uncle. So it's explained that Eggman wanted to excavate this place after discovering artifacts there, but it's going to be held in case of emergency aboard the Death Egg. Finally, one of the Legionnaires asks if the Raiju clan have robot parts. I noticed that, but I assumed their robot parts were all inside them. Because, you'd think the person in charge of legionizing them would have had to write down every person he legionized and send that report back to Eggman. So he could have easily not asked this at all. It doesn't matter though, because there's no consequences to it. The response proves that they don't have robot parts in them at all, and she thinks she's gonna get away with it. I never thought she'd try to put off her people being upgraded, because you'd think Eggman could find out as soon as possible. You'd think he'd already know. I guess she was lying to them that they had all of the cybernetics inside them, and that's why they don't look different. But she'd only get away with that if the person in charge of writing down every person that gets legionized and how was convinced to lie for her somehow. Well, I guess anybody has their price, but I wish I saw that, instead of her just looking like an idiot who's being insanely reckless. Then why did she give herself obvious cybernetics if she could have said the same lie that she just has a metal appendix to delay being a cyborg herself? Then Monkey Khan walks into the room, being allowed to do so, and I can't help but stare at how bad it looks that white highlights are around him for no reason. Sadly, he sees Bunny, so we'll get some drama later. At least he gets made to focus on someone other than her right away. He wants to know why the Raichu clan got an oil shipment, and he's told to leave because it's none of his business. I mean, the shipment won't do anything to his own people directly, it's not like it's gonna get poured all over them. So I get why she says this. The only reason he'd care is that he assumes it's an Eggman thing. He wisely says very well and wants to speak to Bunny first, calling her by her last name alone for some reason. And then the woman that greeted Bunny earlier runs up to Conquering Storm to whisper in her ear instead of just staying where she was. So Conquering Storm agrees, but tells him not to leave the room this time. Somehow Bunny's the first to talk to him. Fortunately, he talks to her calmly at first instead of getting mad right away as he's had character development since he first got introduced. And she tells him she was deroboticized. He says she chose this, and she explains herself some more, and he shows her compassion and gets told that she's made sure someone she cares about will never get this hurt again. He relates to her that he knows what it's like to feel like he failed someone because he was weak, and remembers when he thought Mecha Sally was going to die, even though a robot could be turned back on at any time. Hence why Omega could be turned back on in the future in Sonic 06 after being deactivated for centuries. It's too bad he doesn't tell her what he's remembering. He says hasty decisions can do more harm than good, and he remembers being hasty before. Unfortunately, he doesn't offer an alternative to what she could have done, so from her perspective, he's just calling her hasty for no reason when she thinks she made a brilliant decision, or thought at the time. I know he didn't know Nate Morgan, who gave her new cybernetics effortlessly, but Nicole can instantly engineer things with nanites, so don't tell me she couldn't give her cybernetics in seconds. And Khan met Nicole, so he should have thought of her and told her that was an option, making her decision hasty. Once again though, the story avoids drama because Bunny doesn't get mad at him. I like the story so far. Sure, it's just characters talking, but there's multiple points where they could have blown up at each other for drama and they didn't frustrate me. Instead, these guys interact like friends because they were before. With Khan reassuring her that she's better off than she thinks because she's got allies. He rambles on too long awkwardly, which tries to be funny, 
and she puts her hand on his shoulder, thanking him. Then she wonders what's going on with the chatting Raichu. Khan goes over to them and says that as a fellow citizen of the Dragon Kingdom, what concerns them concerns him, and Bunny offers them help as a legion. The woman explains that the Iron King showed up at the fortress, because he's invincible. I always hoped that he fell in the ocean, so invincible or not, he wouldn't have come back to be an overpowered villain. But still, I can't help but feel like this is awesome. Conqueror Storm tells him he isn't the king anymore, and I know she's betrayed as brave and that's why she's just standing there in front of him. But come on, she knows he's violent, so why would she risk her life? She takes some ninjas at him when she should know he's invincible anyways, so she's just gonna get them killed, abusing them as cannon fodder when it's inevitable that he'll get everything back. The only reason he'd ever fail to take back his fortress when he's so strong is that he'd be grabbed and held by too many people once. But these guys look too small to be strong. The next panel is supposed to have me think he hit her in an inch away, so too bad I didn't see his fist impact with them. Because as cool as Conquering Storm looks, she's not a nice person. Then the Iron King gets attacked and falls over. And Khan complains that the guy's still trying to force himself in a place he doesn't belong. He doesn't belong here anymore, but it was his fortress. So if anything, she doesn't belong here. Khan's asked if he has the fan, and he somehow wastes time asking what's in it for him if he does, when he should remember it's his weakness. He says he doesn't have the fan, but can get it from Stormtomp Village, and it'll take him a bit though. Bunny says she can hold the Iron King off until he gets back, and then as she's badly drawn, he warns her from a cloud to not just fight him alone. It's explained by Conquering Storm that he's got good reason to try to target their armory for its relics. So, why should I be very interested in the fight when the Iron King is invincible? And because the kids is comic, neither of these guys are very likely to get injured. So he's not going to suffer enough, and there's not much in the way of stakes. Bunny fires a laser at the Iron King, but he doesn't act like he's in pain at all. So it's no wonder I find this boring and can't wait for Khan to come back. Which is a shame when it's the part of the story where things actually start happening. At least Conquering Storm has the sense to admit that throwing more Raiju at him is pointless. And it's nice to see her working together with the hero, because I always liked her design. Bunny hits her by accident with an extended arm, and after she's smacked into the ground, her allies talk to her. Bunny warns them to stay back, but they decide to charge on him anyways. Bunny asks if they're insane, and at least gets the response, no more than you, which tries to explain way why they're even bothering to attack someone they should know it's invincible. There's an oddly sweet moment because a team on Eggman's side has someone say they'll sink or swim together. Bunny tells Conquering Storm they should coordinate their squads. Of course it's not working. So Bunny wants to contain him, and Conquering Storm mentions the coil generators she brought with the oil, which she could snare him with. Nothing interesting happens until something gets retrieved for her and she lassoes him, taking advantage of her having a southern accent. That's the perfect way for her to win. So perfect that nobody would expect it because they'd think it'd be dismissed as too predictable. Of course a guy who can't be stopped with injuries would have to be tied up. I'm not sure why he didn't dodge the lasso though. He was looking at her. I know Conquering Storm and her allies are used to dealing with threats by fighting them, so they just fought him at first from force of habit. But you'd think someone would have thought to do this time earlier if they had the coil generators all along. And mostly avoided a whole action scene I got nothing out of. It cuts ahead time to Espio and Khan standing behind a door, and Khan says this is inhumane, and so I'm wondering why Espio is here. Or is that somebody who just looks way too much like Espio? Khan gets told that Jun Kun can't be killed by just food and oxygen deprivation. And when Khan asks how that's possible, even though he knows he's invincible, for no reason she doesn't explain it when anyone could, and instead gives him a condescending answer that she'd know wouldn't reassure him that it's much to learn about this kingdom and its history. I hope we learn about it instead of the story ending then. Khan should have known that being invincible would mean immunity to starvation and oxygen deprivation because the body can't change in a negative way for more than a second if it's invincible. It'd be more interesting if he was told that instead of this line. And it'd feel more satisfying that the king is trapped in a prison if we saw him in it at least once. So the bad-looking legionnaire thanks the Raiju clan for giving her allies a place to stay until the storm passed. So there was a storm, but it didn't matter at all to the story. So it only happened to make the fight look cool. Why bother foreshadowing the storm then? 
Come to think of it, once cybernetics attract lightning because they're made of metal, the storm could have very well been dangerous to Bunny or her allies. So her line earlier would have had a point if it led to impact. Bunny shouldn't have been struck, but her allies, why not? They're told to travel safely, and the story gets surprisingly convenient. Bunny gets asked by a legionnaire if she's coming with them, and she says she's been thinking about the Nanite City. Then the bad-looking character says with a smile that Bunny wants to go home, even though she's on Eggman's side. And she says they were glad to have her along, even though I thought Bunny could be blown up by Eggman at any time. And that's why she didn't leave him a lot earlier. So they're conveniently okay with her going home because they like her after spending so much time with her. But then they'd be warning her not to go home for her own safety. She should be told that she can go visit home for a little while, but has to go back to them or she'll be destroyed. Unless Nicole can get rid of the explosives in her, which she know how to do with the nanites. But these guys don't know that. Bunny smiles as the people expecting her to stay loyal to Eggman are perfectly happy leaving her behind in the UFOs to return to Sonic. This can be explained away, I know they grew attached to her, but there's a reason I never thought this would happen. I guess I figured she'd have to be separated from them for her to break away from them. But to be fair, that wouldn't really happen. So the writer may have felt like this had to be how it happened. It's oddly heartwarming for people on Eggman's side. But I'll prefer being too lighthearted over the opposite any day. It's just that, like I just said, the storm would attract lightning to cybernetics, so it could have easily been that these guys all got struck by lightning, and so Bunny was left on her own, and it make perfect sense instantly that she could go home. So I feel like that'd be more believable than this. Khan compliments Bunny's strength, which comes out of nowhere because it was her lassoing skill that beat Jun Kun. So her strength had nothing to do with anything. And if he means emotional strength, well as much as he knows she's feeling guilty about leaving her friends, him saying this still comes out of nowhere right now. She says she made a lot of mistakes. I think she just made two mistakes, from my recollection. One of them in issue 40. And that's so long ago she'd only be thinking of one mistake. And she'd only think of that as a mistake if she finally realized she could have asked Nicole for cybernetics instead. She doesn't say that. So this dialogue is forced because if she made mistakes in helping the Legionnaires, she had to. She wasn't responsible for what she was doing there. And I think the only mistake she was making with them was fighting Jack and his thugs, who were jerks, so you think she would have enjoyed it the whole time anyways. So why is she beating herself up? She says she's got to start correcting her mistakes, and the first thing to do is head home. She left a note before she left. So what's to correct? It's not like they thought she turned evil or died, and so she has to correct her mistake by correcting the wrong assumption. He says he'd like to escort her home, but she refuses because she wants to have enough experience flying with her old limbs that they'd feel like her old cybernetic limbs by the time she'd get home. Doesn't mean he can't use the cloud to go with her. Unless her logic is that he flies way faster than his cloud. And she wants to go home as fast as possible, not slow down and keep him next to her. I kind of wish she said that. They hug, and the story ends with her not home yet. Which is annoying because it takes a while for new issues to come out. And we looked forward to seeing her go home for so many years, but no, the story ran out of comic space, so we've got to only see her come home in a story dedicated to stuff happening there. I get a feeling like it had to have an action scene because it's Sonic, so it would feel wrong to have the whole issue be characters talking most of the time, except in extreme circumstances, but you could have trimmed it down by a lot to have the space for her to go home with a time skip, and then hug her friends, and that'd be a more satisfying end to the story. Instead, we still have to wait for what we've been waiting for for years. This issue by Inky Way Wishes was about Bunny dealing with the Iron King when he tries to take back his fortress. Only for Bunny to lasso him and get easily allowed by her allies to go home because they like her so much. So it was an oddly convenient issue. Complete with Khan seeing Bunny with the Legionnaires and then calmly talking it out with her instead of yelling at her, which avoids some drama I was worried about. And that kind of writing reminds me why I love Archie Sonic Online. It's so much better written. Never thought Bunny could just be allowed by the Legionnaires to go home, but she'd be waiting forever to be separated from them long enough to go home without their permission. So I guess I can understand the writer making it work out like this, even if it feels weirdly convenient to an underwhelming extent. 
especially since I understand that they didn't have them get struck by lightning instead because it's just a kid's comic. It's just that if that happened to them, then it instantly makes sense that she could just go home. Instead of it being even remotely a stretch. So it tried to not be underwhelming by having an Iron King fight. But the guy didn't injure anybody in his fight. So it doesn't feel like they're lucky they survived and should be really proud that they beat him. They all just wasted their time until one thing happened at the end. And it came out of nowhere in this arc just to have a story about him. He comes back to his fortress to take over it because it was his fortress. And sure he was attacking what's probably good people to try to take it back, but it's still his fortress before hers, so he felt like he had to to get past them. It's not like he has another house, it's not like all of the other times he showed up where he was clearly just in the wrong, doing nothing but trying to hurt the heroes when he doesn't have to. So while it's great that he got imprisoned, it'd be more satisfying if it happened after he attacked the village. So it would feel like he was really a jerk who got karma at the end, and the hero saved the day. He didn't remind us that he'd be a selfish tyrant if he was in charge again, which he could have done if he had grunts working for him and mistreated them. The Iron King's only the bad guy here because we know he'd be an evil ruler and so he shouldn't get to be a ruler again. But I guess conquering a storm is evil too. So at that point, neither of them should have had the fortress. But Jun Khan deserved it a little more because it was stolen from him. The only reason he's in the wrong is that he still should have tried to hurt what's probably good people just to get his fortress back when he could go live somewhere else. So effectively, he was doing the same thing as he'd be if he was attacking a village. Except there he'd cause collateral damage to buildings too, making for impact. I'd actually care and be shocked at what he's doing if he was damaging houses near what looked like normal villagers. Not fighting ninjas who are already used to fighting. There could have been a village in front of the fortress he'd have to go through to get it. And he has no trouble at all in the fight scene, so what's the point? I guess my point is the issue's boring. But it's not frustrating with Khan being mad at Bunny, so I still have a lot of respect for it. That and it returned characters with designs that I like. Bunny loves so him like a Texas girl with coil generators, so that's great. But she must have been fast for him to not dodge it. And this was after a boring, unsatisfying action scene where nothing that matters happens. I like seeing slapstick against him a lot where he clearly feels the pain, but that didn't happen. Because he's invincible and was always knocking around people effortlessly. Just because of what he's capable of, he can't really have a cathartic fight scene against him. It's much better to have at least a little fight than to see him get lassoed instantly. That'd feel underwhelming. But you'd think this would have happened a little earlier if she always knew she had this thing available. And he ended the story in prison. That's even worse of fate than he had before, when we all thought he fell in the ocean and stayed there. So he accomplished nothing, and the only point of him being brought back was to lengthen the story with an obligatory action scene, because just dialogue is boring. This was an alright issue. But I'm very concerned by Sonic Graham saying that the next issue might have Scourge and Fiona in it. Because I don't trust the writers not to make them pointlessly pure evil after Mobius Legends did an abysmal job with them when their entire history before Flynn had them not as evil as I'd expect. Especially Fiona. Like, why didn't Scourge kill Patch or try to destroy Knothole? But I bet this will stick with their mangled, flanderized characterizations just because they're the most recent ones. So I'd have preferred if they never came back then. I don't want them to be like Joker and Harley Quinn, that's unoriginal and would make Fiona look insanely stupid forever dating him. Because if there was nothing good about him to pleasantly surprise her, she'd have had no reason to like him to begin with. But if there was, it'd retroactively improve the writing around her giving him a chance, kind of fixing her character assassination. Scourge doesn't have to just act pure evil with her having no reason to stay with him. So you can still make her good again, but not deprive Scourge of the one person who cares about him they desperately needs in his life to be happy. Because they can fight Eggman, and still date each other. She doesn't have to put up with people who hate her. Did you notice he was never happy, and nothing but a grouch until she came along? If Scourge will do the same plan again, that's pointless to waste her time with. Oh, he's invading Freedom HQ again, then he'll get kicked out again, so whatever. I don't want to see him trapped in prison when he'd be great at fighting Eggman. He's just a version of Sonic who wastes his time. And Fiona wouldn't do anything unique and interesting for any team. And just brings out the worst in the Freedom Fighters as people by having them act resentful of her. So it's nothing but drama, there's nothing to look forward to in her seeing them again. 
We've wanted their plot threads wrapped up for years, but really, there's too many pure evil villains in Sonic who do nothing but fight the heroes, so they add nothing and give me nothing to anticipate but tedium. Might as well have the heroes fight robots instead, because it's functionally the same experience, except the dialogue will be more frustrating. Let's have Scourge taunt Sonic again, never saw that before. Let's have Fiona taunt the heroes again, never saw that before.